So our next speaker this afternoon is somebody that I know that you're going to enjoy um, because he's a, a good personal friend of mine, and uh, I always enjoy listening to Hugh. Um, Hugh Flax is the, a dentist's dentist. The guy is incredibly knowledgeable about a lot of things when it comes to our profession, um, one of which that he is heavily immersed in is cosmetics. And if I needed to have some uh, some dentistry done and I was anywhere near the Atlanta area, this guy is the guy I would call. So let me give you his, his intro. Um, he is internationally respected for his leadership in cosmetic, cosmetic dentistry. He was the past president of the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, the AACD. So that should tell you something about him right out of the boat. Uh, he's delivered lectures and published on lasers, smile design, and advanced restorative techniques in Europe, Japan, Canada, the US, and pretty much everywhere in between, uh, enabling dental teams to offer world-class patient care. He's a Coise Center graduate. He founded the Georgia Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, is on the editorial board of the Journal of Cosmetic Dentistry, and has chaired many AACD meetings. He's a certified fellow of the World Clinical Laser Institute, a master of the International Congress of Oral Implantologists, a diplomat of the American Board of Aesthetic Dentistry, a decade-long member of Catapult Education Speakers, and visiting faculty at the Dental School of Georgia. He recently published A Smile is Always in Style, which is a book that he wrote. And this is one of the, the really great things I think that, that speaks a lot about Hugh. Proceeds from that book support educational scholarships to help individuals looking for dental wellness and a better smile become savvier about their choices. So obviously this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, he is a, a really great presenter. You're gonna enjoy what he's got to say. And I am really honored and proud to say that Hugh Flax is also my friend. So Hugh, take it away. John, thank you for that intro. You know, I, I, I'm turning 62 soon and I just, um, with, with lo lost memory, I'm starting to remember the things that I've done in my career. So I appreciate that. Um, so uh, it's great to be here. I am honored to be on this group uh, and I love sharing this particular topic, uh, how to create teeth in a day. Uh, that's that's the probably the informal way of describing it. So uh, why don't we uh, just move forward here and uh, my, my vision for doing this is um, based on this. Uh, this is a picture of my mom and everybody, you know, has a why for what they do. My uh, mom, uh, we, this is a picture when we lived in Massachusetts before we moved to Florida. And when we moved to Florida, my mom stopped smiling all of a sudden. And that really bothered me because I was the one that was always causing trouble. So I thought I was the reason that... Uh, she wasn't smiling. And um, what I really found out is my dad, my dad told me that she was having a lot of dental work done and uh, she was embarrassed by how she looked and she was very fearful about going to the dentist. And that, uh, because I couldn't be the fifth Beatle, the Beatles had, you know, shut down business in 1970. And I realized being an astronaut was a very political thing at that time. Uh, we won't go into that, uh, but I, so the transformation my mom went through, she all of a sudden started smiling. She was like going to my ball games, started to go out. She was becoming the life of the party again. And I said, hey, that sounds like a cool thing to get into. Um, long story short, moving forward, I realized that my mom's dental work wasn't holding up as well. Uh, after, dental, after dental school, she actually had her second remake makeover and uh, she actually went through three remakers. I just made a solemn promise to always do right for my patients. So that's where really where I'm coming from. Where I, I don't know what the why you got into dentistry. I don't even know why you're spending time with me on a Friday. But what I hope to do is, is it help merge your why with the result that you want to have 
and give you the hows on uh, ultimately on what I did, what I do, and hopefully I've given you a recipe for success. So uh, I've been very blessed uh, over my career to travel to some cool places. One of the times I got to travel to New Zealand and that to me is was definitely a bucket list thing. But I'm here in Georgia. I've been here for almost uh, 45 years now. And uh, I, I'm a huge music fan. I've gotten to see almost all these um, musicians except for uh, Otis Redding. So, uh, but I'm a big music fan. And uh, when I'm not going to music, this is where I'm at. This is my office and the Casa de Flax. And um, I am just very blessed to do this. We moved in here in 2016. Amazing how time flies, it's been five years. And um, usually this slide shows a few things. I don't know if we're gonna be able to do that, but that's okay. Um, I'll just show my youngest child, my dog, Josie, uh, who is just an uh, amazing, fun dog to uh, have. But you know, one of the reasons why I'm here is really because I've had great mentors like Carl Misch, uh, Ed Mills, um, uh, Jaime Lozada, Joseph Kahn, uh, John Coyce, along the way that really given me uh, the insights to really think through dentistry, not just copy techniques and get into the latest and greatest trend and fad because there's so much out there, especially, you know, if you look online, there's a lot of stuff that's digital. And um, what I, I hear, I'm, I'm here to say is sometimes you have to under, have, know the basics in order to use digital. Don't use digital to compensate for things you just don't know how to do in analog. So um, if you looking at this picture right here, and I don't know if my cursor is showing this, but this is the way they replaced legs way back when. They gave people the peg leg. And this guy was uh, pretty non-functional, as you could tell. And here you are, the discredited Pastorius running uh, a race here. But nevertheless, uh, he had his legs replaced with these amazing high-tech legs to replace uh, his, gave him the ability to run and to run at a very high speed at an Olympic level. And that's where we're at in dentistry. We've been able to take the old school way of doing uh, dentures or, and start with the extractions and maybe you might get an immediate denture and maybe you would have grafting done at that time. Uh, but eventually the implants would get placed later on and then you would get a final denture um, and I've had friends who uh, they didn't live close enough to me that uh, ended up going through this whole process. And one of them didn't even get an immediate denture. So when I told them, hey, we, we don't have to do that. We, in our practice, we extract the teeth with a, with the surgeon, of course, and we place the hybrid and in interim with the implants the same day and then let that heal up. And he was just astounded to do that. And to me, that is, the, to me, the standard of care. If someone can, and of course, somebody has to be able to afford it, but I'm always trying to offer my patients the best standard of care. And years ago, uh, you know, we had stone tools and we've evolved into the computer mouse. And Steve Jobs said it very succinctly. If you're going to be a leader and not a follower, you have to be innovative. And just around the time I started to discover teeth in a day, I, I'm a YouTube uh, guy and at least once a month, I'm watching one YouTube video. There's so many things you try to do, but I'd make it a discipline, at least watch one. And anything that is a presentation that has the word sex in it, it's gonna be very attractive to people. So I, of course, check this one out. And I, I think uh, that uh, Matt Ridley pretty much uh, summarized what I'm trying to share with you, that if you bring human beings together and use their brains and enable those brains to combine and recombine, share with each other, uh, eventually they do mate and you come up with innovative ideas. That's how ideas have sex. 
And so what we're going to learn today is not just how ideas have sex, but actually how we've evolved into doing teeth in a day. And my approach in doing that is very different than a lot of people now because I've stayed a bit analog. We're, we're digital in our, our planning, but we're analog in the way we perform the treatment. And you'll see why that's worked well for me. But the main reason why we do that is you look at a, a cone beam and you do get a lot of information. It's incredible uh, that uh, many of my colleagues before me did the dentistry they did, they placed implants and it was all two dimensional, but there is no guarantee when you're placing multiple implants that that bone is gonna be the same quality you think it is. And you may have to give the surgeon some freedom to be able to place that implant. So we give our surgeon some freedom and where to place that because there may be a better place uh, to place that implant that it's gonna be bone supported and the torque value is gonna be very high. Uh, so what we're gonna to learn today is uh, pre-treatment facial analysis. What are the things that we do to guarantee that our smiles are gonna look fantastic and that we create a prescription instead of just guesswork for uh, the, the lab technicians as well as the surgeon. So there's that synergy between all of us that we're gonna, as we say here in the South, get her done. And then we use technology to help support this process in creating our velectomy guides and with our 3D printing. So in 1989, uh, there was a great study that talked about placing implants. And one of the things that uh, they that we learned is that when you place multiple implants, if you're doing that, you want to place them in a way that compensates for the curvature and avoid any cantilever loading. And when you do that, uh, ideally, you're going to do that with as many implants as possible. But there gets to be a point where uh, you run out of bone. So you have to be thinking, is there a better engineering pr principle that allows you to compensate for those things? So um, Jaime Lozada and his group uh, at Loma Linda, uh, really made a very profound analysis that when someone doesn't get their teeth, uh, when they get the extractions, it, it creates huge psychological problems for them. Uh, and when you can uh, use osseo integration principles along with really excellent aesthetics and use the proper engineering and loading protocol, you come up with a very predictable way of really changing somebody's life instead of them falling into the pit of having a, a miserable life like many other people do. So amazingly enough, uh, four short years later, and time flies very quickly, uh, this article was published by people who never would have dreamed about doing this type of uh, treatment. Uh, Cole Mish never really approached that much in any of his books. Um, and uh, some of the other great names on there didn't do, but they got together, they saw the, the um, writing on the wall, they saw the future and a better way of doing dentistry for people, doing immediate loading and implant dentistry, but especially doing it for large cases. And um, it doesn't show up very well on my screen, but there are a couple arrows in here that show uh, that if you were going to do the uppers, uh, you have to, you know, they, they talk about, you know, teeth at a day, all on four, well, all on four. If you lose one implant for some potential complication, uh, that is not a good thing. You've lost 25% of your plumbing or your support. So ideally you're placing at least six. Sometimes if it's a bigger person that has very, uh, a lot of clenching and uh, heavy musculature, you may want to place eight. Now, the lower the bone is denser, that uh, you're going to pro you could get away with four and possibly go with five. Um, and you think about this. This is a picture I took when I was traveling up near Athens, Georgia, where REM uh, got their start. And you could see this this railroad track. And you see all the trestles, and you see right here where all these trestles are supported by these angulated um, supports. So if you go here to this next thing, you see 
just the engineering prowess of this process that allows this train track, which is very narrow and is very long to be supported and not shift because that, that could be a huge disaster with a train. So you can see that you can zoom along like this. So how does this apply to teeth? Well, when, when I did my first uh, teeth in a day case, which I'm gonna share with you in a little bit, I, I just drew this out for myself because I needed to create a visual for myself and how this all works. So uh, the, the key is that having the locations prescribed with a surgical guide, very similar to the digital, we're just, we just don't have um, um, uh, holes and guides to place it that are very specific. Uh, we, want to give our, we want to give our surgeon some freedom and you'll see what I mean by our surgical guide. And then the positions place where the teeth are supposed to go. You want the implants uh, at the long axis of the teeth. I've seen some cases where the implants are sticking out to the side of where the prosthesis is. And that, that just can't be a good thing aesthetically, but it can't be a good thing uh, functionally as well. So um, there's a huge difference when you're doing restorations with a complete denture. These are all the things that we did in dental school on the left side. And then it, obviously we're not in dental school anymore that um, we use not just panos anymore, but we use a diagnostic wax up, very similar to what we did before, but we're also using cone beams and we're looking at the residual ridge condition and looking at this keratinized tissue. Those are massive changes in the way we plan our cases. Actually speeds things up, but nevertheless, these are key ingredients and uh, if a patient says to me, hey, I want this, but they don't want to do these steps, I'll just, I just tell them, well, I can't do your treatment. I'm just, I, I, need the, I need the ingredients to give that level of success. So here's a patient of mine. This is my epiphany case, and we all have those. Um, and this uh, could have looked at as a, as a loss, but I don't think I'm a loser. I, I believe that when I'm not winning, I'm learning. And this was a case that I, I was learning. And I had this a patient that was seeing me for emergency treatment for many, many years. She had periodontal problems and she wanted me basically to patch things up. And then she showed up, uh, I think she'd been on hiatus or on vacation from our practice. And she said, my teeth are unstable. Um, she's ready to go ahead and overhaul her teeth. And uh, She's very anxious about treatment uh, in terms of not just the pain, but also she is a, a, a trainer. So she wanted to look good. Uh, who doesn't want to look good? But she also has to speak to other people. So she wanted to be uh, successful while she's on stage. She also noticed, and I guess, you know, with the internet people, she, she found that she thought she was getting Bell's palsy because of the infection in her mouth. So when you look at her case, you can see, uh, she, well, you didn't have her before, but you can see teeth are starting to shift. She's getting spaces here, teeth are starting to flare out. You can see the decay developing on these areas that we patched up. And when you look at things even more close up, you can see a lot of these uh, roots starting to get exposed, margins are getting exposed as well. And then when you look at the x-rays, you just see just how much bone she was losing. And uh, here's, here's a, one of my first lessons. She had no bone. This bridge was very loose. And when I took my original impressions, don't ever do this because uh, you're giving somebody a free extraction. Don't ever do it with polyvinyl, with PVS. So she got a free extraction. And, but she was mad at me because of that. And she's a little bit of a hothead. But uh, ultimately, uh, I, I want her over. So as, as John mentioned, I'm a big uh, proponent of John Coyce's philosophy. And John has a great analogy. He's very um, poetic and philosophical about what we do. And he looked at what dentistry is very simply solving a Rubik's Cube. And I, I share this analogy with a lot of my complex cases. So when you're dealing with a Rubik's cube. You can think of that in dentistry as different colors uh, of uh, with each risk factor. So with one color would be the biomechanics. And in Maggie's case, 
she had decayed multiple teeth and many teeth had it had root canals. And then you were seeing here, she had completely lost periodontal support. It was generalized, it had gotten to the point where all the surgery she had done was going downhill and her teeth were getting loose. And the next problem was occlusal dysfunction, which was causing uh, occlusal trauma and, and just loosening up the teeth. Of course, she um, tends to, she's a bit high strung and she clenches and bruxes which doesn't make things very easy. And um, there was no medical management uh, needed despite her medical history. And then uh, she, I wouldn't quite call her high risk aesthetics, but she shows a big smile, so does her papilla. So we really could not uh, let her down. And so once you are able to come up with solutions to each one of these risk factors, you solve the Rubik's Cube and you get a very predictable type of treatment. Um, so with Maggie, my prescription for her based on, we'll call it stinking thinking, it just the evolution of what I learned in dental school was we did immediate upper and lower overdentures. We sedated her for doing that. We did the extractions and I did some grafting and we did uh, root canals, and that that at least helped uh, keep the bone preserved around those teeth, and left the door open for eventually doing implants with attachments. And it's interesting; all of a sudden, Maggie really started paying attention to how she was going to look, which was great. So, never before had she brought in any pictures about how it looked, but this was extremely important to her. So um, uh, we did that treatment and all of a sudden she started, I mean, like a huge improvement. She had white teeth, she didn't have spaces, but she immediately noticed, and I don't think Maggie was dysmorphic at all. She just had a very high level attention to detail. So you could see the midline wasn't matched up. The midline of the teeth wasn't matched up to the globella. I was close but a millimeter off was like a, a football field to Maggie. And so we were looking for, and the bottom line with her is that we improved her appearance, but of course, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. We absolutely eliminated her, you know, extracting teeth is a great way to eliminate uh, periodontal risk. Uh, she had a better bite, but unfortunately that bite was unstable and uncomfortable because they were immediate dentures, and she was very challenged by just maintenance. It was hard for her to talk. The muscles were just challenging, and, and some people are just, just can't tolerate that type of treatment. So her proprioception was uh, getting in the way. Uh, she felt that her facial tissue was also affected by the Bell's, Bell's palsy, and she's extremely demanding as well. So look back on this, was this right, the right treatment of choice? And this was around the time that I started really take, taking a hard look at, is it a wise idea to do immediate dentures any longer? Did she get what she wanted? And I could categorically say, no, I didn't give her what she wanted. I had a very, very unhappy patient. And uh, as um, uh, Rita Mae Brown said, good judgment, judgment comes from experience and often it comes from bad judgment. And I made a bad call with this particular patient. She was very clear that she wanted to look great. And because she was on stage talking to people, um, she didn't want to feel any insecurity and there wasn't enough adhesive in the world that would ever make her secure. So, um, you know, here it comes now. I was like Homer Simpson Yay! and I needed better information. So I actually uh, took a trip to Vegas, took a, a day with Nobel and learned about teeth in a day. Didn't learn it from a magazine. I want to immerse myself in that. And one conclusion I came to is that uh, if I'm going to do this, I didn't have the surgical skills to do that. So it was very clear to me that I need a surgeon to be able to do that. And I've talked with a lot of um, 
surgeons who place the prosthetics in a day and it's, it's, it's very, very stressful. And uh, I, that's just not the kind of stress I need in my life. The second thing I realized is um, I wanted, I, I had gone up to uh, Balshi's office in uh, outside of Philadelphia and saw what they did. And it was fantastic what they did. Uh, he'd learned from Palo Malo and uh, I, I was very impressed with what they did. I didn't like the way they did conversions. And what I mean by conversion, how you attach the prosthesis to the implants. They used uh, acrylic that um, they cured it in the mouth. Uh, and there are a lot of people that still do it that way. I just wanted something that was uh, more of a healing type of prosthesis and uh, wanted to create as much uh, assurance that I was gonna, it, it didn't break. Cause that, that's probably the biggest disaster in restorative dentistry uh, is when you have a prosthesis um, that's uh, uh, over implants and then that prosthesis breaks. So we didn't want any cantilevers and we wanted to have something that was healing and something that was uh, stress-free. So what we decided to do is I, I created my, we'll call it my Atlanta team uh, with, I, I now have two surgeons on that team. And also I have my, my main man, uh, Robin Johnson, who you may, met, some of you may know him, absolutely fa fantastic. And he learned his stuff with, from uh, working at um, Clear Choice. He was doing prosthetics for them. And Aldo Louie Party was doing a lecture in Atlanta and Aldo's a fantastic prosthodontist. And Robin was there, we just talked each other's ear off. And it was like, I, I found my lab guy to do it because I, I, don't, I don't want any headaches. I want it to go as smoothly as possible. I want it to go as well as a veneer case would go. So Robin could give me that, that sense of assurance. So we took a comb beam on Maggie and you could see not, not a lot of bone uh, and she didn't want to do sinus lifts or anything like that. So she was very uh, impressed with the idea of doing this. Now, one of the things that happened with a lot of the extractions I did is I grafted some of those tissues and by preserving some, some teeth as well, we actually preserved bone long run that the uh, uh, media dentures didn't destroy that bone and we had something to work with. But so when, when we're thinking about the aesthetics, we want to get that midline right. I obviously show where I screwed up. Uh, you want the, the facial thirds to match and the tip of the canines, you want them not only slightly showing in repose, but you also want them match up with the ala of the nose. And uh, you want the posterior um, uh, occlusal plane to meet the labial angle of the front, of the front teeth at 90 degrees. If you do those, uh, everything tends to work very successfully. Uh, that's how I handle my, my veneer cases. So it's the same thing. So uh, we just apply it to removable or actually to non-removable cases. Because So this is Robin's prescription that he does. And he comes with, with me uh, and we do the facial analysis together. So this is a, uh, a vertical, instead of using the bully gauge that we have, we have something that is much more efficient and easy to transfer over to uh, our um, prescription as well as use it on the day of surgery. And this is something that Ivacar put together from the Blue Line Smile Design uh, Kit. And that's worked well. And then of course, we're doing, you know, wax up, or working with a wax rim. Now, if we've got a patient that has teeth, obviously we're not doing that. But in this case, that's what we did. Uh, and in this case, we did not, uh, we, we used a, um, uh, a fox plane to match the uh, pupils in the posterior occlusal uh, planes together. And it's incre incredibly important how the posterior occlusal plane, you want that matching campers plane and also you want it to Kind of fall into that curve of Wilson. None of these things change at all. So here we are and you can see how precisely we got that in, in Maggie's case. And 
then we just start making our marks. Okay, and you'll, you'll see where we do this on non-edentrous uh, patients. But here we are uh, matching our midline, doing our uh, canine positions where the tip of the canines match the aorta of the nose. And you can see here, we had bone that we need to remove. It's very, very important that uh, not only th that we, we have these uh, aesthetic landmarks working properly, but we also want to, and here we ha have the uh, CR uh, matching up and we've mounted this case. I'm trying to get to this next slide and it's mounted in, C in CR so we get appropriate freeway space and use our mounting plate uh, that is converts uh, John Coyce's facial analyzer to the Ivacar Stratus Articulator. And here's a slide I, I wanted to get to, that um, we could visually show uh, where we need our astectomy to go. And uh, this is something Carl Misch said, and this is absolutely critical that, to have enough strength in the, in the prosthetic material to be able to keep it from fracturing. It, 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 even if you have titanium in it, you're going to fracture acrylic if you don't create enough bulk in here. So at minimum, we want to have 14 millimeters from the sizal edge to where that bony implant, plant, that, that platform is for the implant. That's what's going to give us the strength of the material. You see where the canine position is and you see where the midline position is. It's a great visual for our, our surgeon but we give them something that's a whole lot more practical when they're doing the surgery. Now, one thing I'm, I'm just going to share with you, everybody knows that Brandemark uh, is famous for osseo integration. And yes, from a biological standpoint, that's extremely important because you obviously, you, if you're placing implants, you want that bone to integrate. But from the patient's point of view, here's something to be thinking about. Because it's, they, they, Usually if they're getting implants, they are having mobile bone and, or they may have loose dentures or partials. And then they're switching into something that is rigid, that doesn't move. That's a huge change for them. It's a huge change for them uh, from a functional standpoint. It's a huge change for them in terms of the bone integrating. So, one of the things that uh, Robin is doing is here's our um, incisal edges, edges of the uh, anteriors. And you want to have anterior guidance here, but then you want to go and share that guidance so that when the uh, anterior teeth pass each other, you've got the canines taking over that will give the patient a better sense of control. Um, it, it's kind of like there, there are some people that can drive a stick shift and there's some people that just are, are just don't know what to do. And in this particular case, having that extra K9, that shared proprioception and protrusion decreases the anterior wear, but also decreases torque on the implants and makes the patient feel comfortable. A brilliant concept that Robin shared with me. The other thing, of course, in terms of the prosthetics is you want to minimize screw loosening. That is not a good day for a patient to be calling you, say that their uh, prosthesis loosened or fractured. So you want to have the implant parallel the forces of occlusion and you minimize the cantilever. And um, by doing our um, system, by do having our uh, surgical guides set up for the ostectomies, as well as giving our surgeon freedom to place the implants where not only we get good integration, good torque value, we also have better prosthetic and functional results. Um, this, this is using functional, well-researched uh, concepts versus, oh, let's go ahead and try the latest and greatest, and then we've got uh, problems later on. Uh, like they say, Houston, we have a problem. I don't want to be saying that in these type of cases. These patients invest a lot of money into these cases. So you can see here our uh, oral surgeon uh, and our restorative team are sharing information with each other. And uh, we 
just plan this out. And Maggie didn't want any part of doing a sinus lift. So we guesstimated where the implant locations are. And uh, I'll show you how we took the guesstimate out. But this, we, we started with our velectomy guide to show exactly the, or prescribe to the surgeon where we're gonna hide the seam, where we're gonna have the implants vertically placed and allow proper thickness for the, the restorative materials. And then having a surgical guide to have mesial buccal and um, mesial, uh, excuse me, buccal lingual and mesial distal placement of the implants, uh, which is not only uh, made sure that our aesthetics is gonna be right, but it's also gonna give us uh, less chance of non-axial loading on the implants. Um, we also have an orientation bite that we use to make sure we stay in CR and helps us in uh, doing, the case, uh, doing the case to make sure everything fits together later on. And then we use our, um, we'll call it a high tech plastic bully gauge uh, to verify uh, the, the video uh, at the time of during, while we're doing surgery. So these are the ma magic things that we use. So here's our, our velectomy guide. And then you can see here, this is the window version of a surgical guide instead of it, instead of having um, rings to place your implants uh, through. This gives us a little bit more freedom, a little more flexibility because if you don't, uh, if you have done any uh, digital placement and I, I do a lot of guided surgery, it's not a good day when uh, things aren't working out. So uh, there's enough stress uh, in this. This gives our surgeon enough information and he shows us where we're placing it. It's not like he's just doing this uh, off the cuff. Uh, we're there, all three of us are there at the surgery and making sure that everything is where we got to go. That's a solemn thing that I do with my patients. So during the surgery, we were also verifying our landmarks and our plan was to have a clear vision of where we want to go. We know exactly where our implants are going to go. And we want to stay within that window, as I showed you, so that the um, uh, implants are coming through on the lingual or the occlusals of the teeth, and they're not showing. And uh, what we usually do is we, in the upper six, because usually we do six, uh, we have uh, two in the premaxilla, usually in the laterals. Then we have two anterior to the sinus wall. That's usually number five and 12. And those are angled on that wall that is anterior to the sinus. And then we usually place them in the zygoma. And a couple of cases, uh, we end up using the pterygoid because maybe there's just not much room for that. So um, during the surgery, our surgeon using a very high tech pencil uh, for this. This is uh, from, this case was from 2012. And, but we're using irrigation and, but he knows exactly where the bone is supposed to be reduced. And then he's going ahead and, and placing the implants. And um, both uh, Gordon Brady and Shivam Gupta are fantastic surgeons. They do a wonderful job for our patients. And once the um, prosthesis is in place, we go ahead and verify the occlusion using our CR bite so that we don't have any guesswork that maybe we're a little bit off here and there. So um, verify again, our CR, we verify our campus plane before we even get to the point where we're uh, placing um, or we're doing our conversion. This is a little bit different than some people, but it gives us uh, a little more accuracy, not actually a little bit, a lot more accuracy in getting the aesthetics and the functional plane that we want to have. Because we got a lower to deal with and we want to make sure the upper is the aesthetics. So that's where we start first. So where we start here is very simply, we um, have the patient, in this case, we're using her lower um, denture to help orient the bite. And um, we took an impression knowing where the, the patient's 
prosthesis or uh, new prosthesis going to be anterior, posteriorly, as well as uh, fitting into the aesthetics that we're looking for. So we're, it will take this impression. And if we don't like the way it looks, we'll do it over again. It's better to do that than just to keep moving forward and we miss, we skip a step here. So uh, the beauty on, on this here is that we're not only taking an impression of the uh, of the gums and where the implants are, we're also creating reference points for when we loot the teeth and begin the, the conversion process. So looks like we got a duplicate of this uh, slide here. There we go. So you can see here, as I was mentioned before, we've got the anterior implants index right here. This is where we're going to start a looting process. And then we got a posterior stop that gives us that X, Y, Z axis uh, dialed in for orientation. So nothing moves and we got everything the way we want to. So one of the challenges in doing a um, uh, conversion in the mouth is it could move. So having those uh, landmarks is very important. But one of the other things that we want to do is we want to index the um, prosthesis with acrylic to actual uh, abutments that we were going to use. And we're using temporary abutments in here because they're they're literally temporary for the time because eventually we're going to have screw um, attachments we're going to attach to the multi-unit uh, abutments. But um, the patient is closing and in order to do that properly and have the right VDO, we have to use a soft cure acrylic. So um, very simply, we go ahead and we already have coated these temporary abutments with a little acrylic so that they become uh, very adhesive. And we know where those holes are gonna be because we got those in the impression. So we paint the cylinders and then we carve holes in here so that there's enough clearance for the cylinders. And then we cut down the cylinders once we have that clearance so that the patient is allowed to close. Seems a little bit complex, but when you see the results, you'll you'll appreciate where we're going. So we use GC's Unifast acrylic, uh, Unifast acrylic here, and the reason why we use that one, it's it becomes very flowable, and uh, it's extremely accurate. It cures very quickly. Uh, oftentimes, if you do a light cure, uh, there is there could be some distortion. So um, this is what uh, Robin has elected to use and it's worked extremely well. We want a passive fit with our temporary prosthesis, but we also want a passive fit ultimately with a fixed prosthesis. So we inject around the temporary uh, cylinders and I'll show you that in just a second. Uh, and then uh, after everything hardens, we unscrew the temporary um, cylinders and we cover the implants with um, um, a um, healing cap so the lab work can get done. So let's go ahead and look at that video right now. I'm trying to cue that up. This video right here. John, can you uh, kind of give them a um, find out if they have that video? They should. It played before. <laughs> Feeling kind of lonely here. Um, well, I would love to show you that video. Uh, it, what, what we do is we mix this stuff up. Uh, very, not too runny. It's got a, kind of a creamy consistency. And then we place it into a um, uh, an irrigating syringe. And uh, we fill the syringe up. And we create, Robin creates a vent hole in there to decrease the chances of bubbles. Because if you have bubbles in there, that could create some distortion in there. 
and then we uh, inject that around. We have the patient close. We know from uh, this, there, there's some leftover in this little mixing cup when it's hardening up, when it's warm, and then when it get finally, the warmth is gone. And then we unscrew the cylinders and we cover the, like I said, we cover the implants here. And this is how it looks. You can see where the healing abutments are right here and here. And then we can uh, tie that all together. And then we, we go ahead and take it to the lab. So while the lab work is being done on the top, that conversion is being done, then we're going to the lower and the, la the surgeon is removing the teeth. And by the time he's done with his part and not only removing the teeth and uh, doing his alveolectomy, as well as placing the implants, we can circle back and um, uh, verify what we have so that the lower can get done next. So uh, in the lab, and I think this is kind of fascinating uh, that Robin does this, you can see where the bone was removed, you can see where the prosthesis is, you can see where the implants are and the extra impression material. That eventually is removed and we put some ginger fast material on here before that's removed to actually simulate the way the gums are. So when acrylic is being added into, it adapts to the current gum tissue as it is. So you get a better healing response that way. And here's Maggie's uh, post-op here. Dr. Brady did a wonderful job on this and boom, much better result. You, can, you can't see the globella here, but you can see the middle line was moved over here and she was much happier, certainly for the aesthetics, but extremely happy with the, um, the functionality. She could chew again, she could talk to people. She felt a lot more confident. She was sore initially, of course, but she felt much more confident. So we let her heal up for about six months. And uh, with some of the new healing protocols, we, we've shortened that a little bit. It used to be six to 12 months, uh, but by using some of the um, uh, bioactive materials, uh, there's bioactive materials for gums and bone, like PRF and things like that, that are PRGF, you make sticky bone, all these things have allowed the healing response to even improve uh, more. So um, when we get to the point where we're gonna go ahead and make her a more permanent restoration with the titanium uh, bar, I'm still not doing um, zirconia because this, the, because of the way Robin designed the occlusion, this is working really, really nicely for us. So um, in the lab, Robin already has the impression that we took before. This is the working model that he had the day of surgery. We keep all this stuff. It's not like we're hoarding things, but we might as well keep all this stuff. And he'll go ahead and place impression copings into the implant uh, analogs and then use these clear rods. And then when we're in the mouth, we'll connect those together with acrylic and we'll do an open tray impression, which is extremely accurate. And we have uh, not quite a menorah in her mouth, but you can see um, we've got uh, everything connected together. I like this little trick of putting the composite, uh, the compules from composites, just putting those over the um, impression copings. It makes it easier to retrieve uh, these open tray uh, impressions. And then we do a cross mounting here and uh, ultimately, uh, Maggie gets her prosthesis, and this is a very handy uh, device. There are a lot of companies that are selling this. Uh, and what's great about this is it, when these really hard to access areas are um, need to be, you know, got let's say the zygoma uh, or the pterygoid implants, it's hard to use a hand um, driver. So this really helps. Another thing is this handle 
uh, not only rotates, so you just kind of hear a little pop and you know you're done. You can also regulate the amount of torque that you're plating, putting on this. Initially, we start with 10 and we've gone up to 10 uh, newton centimeters for our torque. And then to seal these up and, and have some reversibility, we use Gingifast just like we used before. And this is very easy to uh, uh, for us to pop out in case we need to remove this. Once a year, I have uh, my patients come in and we take off the prosthesis and we clean around the implants, make sure they're doing a great job uh, at cleaning. And here is Maggie at this point where she started. Here she is um, in her um, denture. And then you can see how this is a greatly improved here. And she was extremely, extremely happy about that. So that was my epiphany. It, may, it makes total sense. So I don't do immediate dentures uh, very rarely these days. If a patient it doesn't have the resources, we may have to do that. Or I may say, let's go ahead and at least do a teeth in a day uh, implant supported prosthesis on the lower, we got a better chance of stability and then maybe uh, move the, on to that later on with the upper. So speaking of unhappy, Here's a patient that came to see me. We, we almost had to beg her to smile. And she uh, was referred to me uh, by one of her friends. And um, we finally got her to smile and she wasn't a happy camper. You could see she, one, her, she had no uh, teeth showing in her social view on the, on the left side. And looking under the hood, um, and I apologize, I, I sent this in and the radiographs were not in the prosthes in, in the uh, presentation. Um, but uh, major bone loss in the upper. You can see she has implants in here that the gum and the bone are very thin. Uh, major decay here, super eruption of the lower teeth. So we said, okay, first things first, uh, that was her, obviously the upper was her biggest concern, but she didn't want to lose her bottom teeth. So we went ahead and very, very meticulously cleaned the decay out of the lower anteriors, found solid tooth structure, used the laser a little bit to uh, give us a little bit more room and used a zirconia uh, prosthesis that we cemented with Therosem uh, because of the uh, 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 chemical properties. And uh, we had a nice occlusal plane to begin our process of making an ideal restoration for um, our patient. So went through the same process that we used before. You, and when you have a recipe, you wanna just maybe season it a little bit differently, but you wanna keep a lot of the major steps in place. So uh, we're in the middle of surgery here. We place our implants. You can see here, those healing caps are just wonderful because the tissue will collapse around that. It just makes things much, much easier. Here are we are in the conversion process and Robin's uh, liquefied this Ivoclar uh, material uh, for processing, he used a pressure pot uh, processing and we got a real dense material here. I know it's only a temporary prosthesis, but you know, some patients, they, they sometimes skip town. I've had a few people that just never come back for the permanent. And then we polish these up with a special polish that Ivoclar makes. Um, and what's really interesting, look, look how much better her smile is. Uh, obviously, you didn't get the buccal cord or the way we wanted to, but we're using uh, Horaeus Colzer's um, Mondial, the, the Pala uh, tooth, um, uh, and, and they almost look like veneers. They're extremely strong, but what's even more amazing, they're extremely um, aesthetic. And I like... Um, the, um, uh, thank you, John. Uh, I love the, the idea of giving patients the chance to say, I had veneers done. It's really what it it's like Vegas. What goes on at Flaxus stays at Flaxus. So you can see the transformation that our patient went through. No smile, had a smile, and then we, we bumped it up a little bit more. Notice how she just changes her persona, her face is lighting up, 
and um, uh, she kind of growing her hair out. And um, the um, we, we are just in the process, unfortunately, of having to replace her lower teeth because she uh, developed decay on her lower teeth. And now we're just going to go with teeth in a day on that. So we're waiting for, for getting medical clearance before we do that. So our next patient shows the, the evolution of what we've done. Seven-year-old patient who is uh, physically handicapped, but she's one of those unstoppable kind of people. Just love her to death. But she was stopped by the fact that she just, one, didn't have the resources and really didn't have a, a, a dentist that had the vision that we have to uh, take it to the next level. She had this bridge that was getting uh, uh, patched up. It was so mobile that uh, when she would talk, she was afraid the, the bridge and the teeth were going to fall out. So you can see here again, I apologize, no radiographs here. Um, but you can see uh, they, they've been patching this out, but everything is just starting to come out right here. And what made this really challenging is she's also a gagger. So we started out this particular case with um, doing digital impressions uh, on this and gave Robin what he needed, the landmarks he needed to go ahead and, and place the prosthesis. And then uh, when we do her final restoration, uh, we're doing some other things I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, eventually she's going to get the final restoration probably towards the end of the year. So um, again, we've modified our uh, COIS analysis, still using the Ivacar uh, vertical measurement device and using a different version of the COIS um, face bow or uh, analyzer uh, using the glasses that match up with the Gabella that really helped. I wish I had that before. And when we did her case, she had such a different AP spread than our other patients and had enough dense bone that we decided with, because her arch form was so short, we decided to go ahead with four implants. I know that seems a little bit risky, uh, but her bone is, I mean, the torque values we were getting were extremely, extremely high. I think we were getting almost up to 50 on those. So uh, we went with this and then we put PRF uh, with the APRF membranes in here or uh, uh, we'll call it uh, fibrin sushi. And then we use the liquid, the IPRF to irrigate around the tissue. Bottom line that promotes better bone healing and, so and soft tissue uh, adaptation so that the patient uh, will uh, heal up better. And look at the change in her appearance. Just she is just very giddy, outgoing, uh, much more um, just putting herself out there, much more of a goofball than she was uh, before. And we did something cool with her. We uh, have mood, she wanted to get rid of the crowding. So we did a uh, little clear liner therapy and then we split her teeth together uh, because it would just stabilize things and she's much, much happier about that. So now she can chew with some more power. Eventually placing implants back here, once we get the grafting done on that, uh, before we place the implants, we'll go ahead and convert her over to a permanent restoration. The last case I'm gonna show is really uh, an amazing case. Uh, Michael uh, reached out to me, a plastic surgeon's office referred him to me because that's what he. this is what he does for a living. He was very close with the office manager there. And you can see uh, when, when I talked to him over the phone with one of our Zoom calls, he was extremely um, distraught with his life. He didn't feel like he was adequate in terms of his relationships, in terms of his ability to chew, his nutrition was failing. You can see the, the decay uh, uh, that he was getting, all the decalcification here. People, somebody was just patching him up, uh, delaying the inevitable. Uh, lost all this tissue back here. You see his tongue is kind of fitting through there. So we need to open up his vertical, which we did, took our measurements on him and went from what he had before to this. Um, and, and when you look in his face, he's just like a, a whole different person. He wanted it really white because he just is a very gregarious guy. 
and um, it's just uh, uh, he, he's just like off the chain and he's gone into uh, a couple surgeries where I actually happen to know the people in the surgery and say, oh my God, Michael, you look so different, you look fantastic. And he says, well, I bleached my teeth and I, I did veneers. Still not comfortable telling people what he actually did, but I, I don't care. Well, you know, as long as they, you know, that he makes the point of referring them to me and is an ambassador for us, I, I don't care really what he tells people. That's really his business. So let's hear what he has to say. And John, just confirm for me that that is playing. It is playing. Okay, good. All right. If you let me know when it stops, then I'll know when I need to go. Okay. It's about a minute, I believe. So much more confident. Thanks. Uh, the main thing is the way that it changed my life, and I truly mean it changed my life. Uh, I'm so much more confident. Uh, I feel like I'm back to my old self of a big personality and, and uh, uh, not being embarrassed and covering my mouth. Um, I'm able to eat things I haven't eaten in so long from a sandwich to a piece of pizza. Uh, and that sounds like a little thing, but I can't explain to you the magnitude of, of what that means to me and how life changing that is. Um, I'm in sales, my presentations are, are better. I just feel so much more confident. It's made such a difference in exercising and taking care of myself. And, and by, by seeing this and, and, and having that, that confidence and that strength just has affected me every way, health-wise. Uh, just uh, like I said, I'm back to my old self, outgoing, and uh, it has truly been a life-changing experience in every way imaginable. Did the uh, video stop? It should have. It did stop right there. Oh. You. oh, okay, perfect. All right, good timing. That's my middle name, right? So anyways, um, here's some retrospective conclusions. Uh, first of all, I, I truly believe that the materials in terms of restorative, the graph materials, the implant designs are, are just so top notch right now. It, it can be overwhelming in understanding that. That's why I, I truly believe having a terrific surgeon is extremely important. Having a terrific uh, lab person is, is, is true, truly key, but you've given people a choice and not going through what many people have been going through for years or having that peg leg of a smile and struggling through life for many months or years. Uh, and if you have somebody that is expecting a, a higher level of value, you give them something much better for them. Uh, because of the, again, like I said, it was important for me to, to put together a team. Having a lab specialist, Robin is just like incredible. Um, and it's great having that extra pair of eyes uh, during surgery because he sees things I don't see because I don't do that that many cases. We may do about five or six a year. He does one or two every day. So he certainly appreciates that. Uh, the other thing is um, we, again, they need a humble surgeon that is willing to play ball with us. And the time intensive is, will get better with pre-planning as well. So I hope I've given you the 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 uh, so building blocks to work with, and uh, here's my contact information, and I just appreciate your time and attention. I will see you back on the panel. Thanks, Hugh. Thank you very much. Let me get my camera going on here so that I can be part of this again. I really really appreciate what you had to say. You know, one of the things that you said there at the last that I, I think is just really so important is, you know, having surrounding yourself with good people and having good people be part of your team. Um, I, I was uh, was talking uh, the other day with uh, with one of the lab techs that I work with, and um, he was fairly new at the lab. And uh, so I was on the phone with him and I told him, I said, you know, if I send you something that you can't work with, don't try to make it work. You know, if, if you can only do, you know, your best with what I give you and I don't give you my best, then you can't do your best. And uh, I told him, I said, you know, sometimes doctors kind of get hung up on that thing of, you know, I'm right and I'm the doctor and you're the lab tech and, you know, you're like a subcontractor. You just do what I tell you. And we're all in this together. You know, the, the, the amount of information that you can learn from your lab guy or gal, you know, I mean, I may do five 
of the, you know, five, some type of case a year, that person may see five of those a week or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times I'll call uh, my, my Crown and Bridge lab tech who I've been working with for like 25 years now. And, you know, I'll say, what, what do you think about, I'm thinking about doing this. And he'll be like, well, you know what? I did, you know, 10 cases like that with some other doctors last year. Only one of them worked, nine of them failed. Well, why should I then, you know, throw myself in into the statistical wheel when we already pretty much at that point in time know it's not going to work. And we can learn so much if we just stop sometimes and listen to the people around us, whether it's a, a surgeon or you know, your laboratory technician, there's just a lot to be learned from other people. And it's just so much better for everybody involved. If you just, you know, sometimes we open up our, our ears and listen, my, uh, my son, I'm very proud of him. He is a, uh, a third degree black belt in Taekwondo and the, uh, the man that ran his studio used to say, and, and I've heard this from other people too, but I think it's a great lesson. He used to say, God gave you two ears and one mouth. You should listen twice as much as you talk. And I think there's, there's really a lot to be learned from that. So you did a great job, buddy. I am really, really so appreciative of, uh, of what you've given us today. Thank you very, very much.